Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> oh, got to find a sermon. This is kind of embarrassing, the sermon that I'm about to do. Um, we touched on it two weeks ago. James did the sermon last week, and so I want to bring it back up, and that's about the resurrection. And you would think we would have the resurrection down pretty pat as Christians, but it's kind of interesting. The longer you look at something and you think you've got it down, but if you start studying it deeper and deeper and deeper, you start to say, well, I really don't know what I really should know about the topic. And that's kind of what, when you look at the resurrection, you think you've got it all figured out, and guess what? You, you don't have it all figured out, and you've got to re-examine it. And, and that's what I'm going to challenge you with today. So write down the, the scripture references. I'll, I'll send out an email with the, the references on it. But, uh, you know, we have a tendency to believe in something because other people that are wrong in their walk believe this. And so, therefore, we avoid it. We have a tendency to avoid the Holy Spirit in churches of Christ because other churches have a tendency to abuse the, the Holy Spirit in the sense of miraculous works and, and, and this kind of thing. So let's not talk about it. So we have a tendency not to look into certain things because other people mess it up. But that doesn't mean we can't look into certain things. And you've got to dive deep into the scriptures. And... Because of Jesus' resurrection, there are three resurrections, and, that will, and that's what we're going to look at today. And you may think, there's not three resurrections, there's just one resurrection. Well, no, there's three resurrections that you need, I think you need to have down. And uh, I'm not talking about Jesus' resurrection, but because of what he's accomplished, there are three resurrections. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And we picked up on it because when we were doing John chapter 5, he talked about two resurrections. <clears throat> okay? A lot of people think there's a resurrection morning when everybody around the entire world and everybody that's ever lived is going to stand before God and be <clears throat> sorted apart. Well, you have to rethink that. Because there's no place in the scripture that says everybody's going to stand before God. Everybody's going to bow the knee before God. Doesn't say that we're all going to be in the same place. You have to understand that. Yes, everybody's going to give God the glory. But does it all happen in the same place at the very same time? And that's what I want you to think about. And I think that's what Jesus is, is, is talking about here. And the interesting thing is you don't hear a lot of teaching concerning the resurrection until after Jesus' resurrection. And I guess that's kind of obvious, but he doesn't, he, there's only one place when he's talking to the Sadducees about, because they don't believe in a resurrection. Uh, that's about the one place before the resurrection that Jesus actually talks about it. So in John chapter five, Verse, where were we? Verse 27, 26, there. For just as the father has life in himself, so he gave life, he gave to the son also to have life. He gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. 28 and 29, do not marvel. So don't let this bother you. Do not marvel at this, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So we've got two resurrections happening here. The ones to a resurrection of life and the second one to a resurrection of judgment. Well, the wicked are going to a resurrection of judgment. Okay, and they are going to stand before the throne and they are going to be held responsible for the things that, that, they, that they've done. But those that are righteous, that did good deeds, are going to a resurrection of life. They're going to come before God. And that's important to understand. There's two separate things happening right here. And, and we kind of touched on this and, and I'm going to add a few verses here. You need to jump to Revelation chapter 20. Because in, in Revelation chapter 20, he's talking about the judgment day. Um, actually, he's talking about 
the Christians who die in the, in the persecution in chapter 20. But in verse, verse 5, here he's talking about the judgment of the dead. He says in verse 5, the rest of the dead didn't come to life until the thousand years were completed. And he's talking about the first resurrection where he was talking about the Christians coming to God. But the dead didn't come to life until the thousand years were completed. So this is the resurrection of the dead that he's talking about. And we see it in, in verse 12 uh, in chapter 20. I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead, which were judged. From the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, everyone according to their deeds. Now I stress the word the dead. Because John talks about the spiritually dead. In the gospel of John. And so you need to understand that's what he's talking about here. When people die, if they're not in, well, before. In Jesus' time, when people died, they either they went to Hades and they went to one of two places, Abraham's bosom, because they had a relationship with God, and the other place was torment. Well, the torment is the dead, okay? That's the wicked. Those guys are not going to stand before God until judgment day. You need to understand that, okay? So that's the resurrection of the dead that he's talking about. Jesus gives us a little bit of insight here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 to 24. And that's when he was condemning a couple of cities. Chapter 11, verse 20. Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethesda. If the miracles had occurred, if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say it will be more tolerable in for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And that's what he was talking about in, in John chapter 5, right? The wicked are coming to a resurrection of judgment. And so that's what he's saying about those cities. Tyre and Sidon, if they would have seen the miracles that you guys saw with Jesus, they would have repented. So it's going to be better off for them. They're still getting condemned, right? But it would, it, you know, you guys are in, in, in a world of hurt. So that's the resurrection of the dead. They're all going to stand before the throne of God. Okay. The resurrection of life. Now let's get back to Matthew or John chapter five, where he's saying, do not marvel. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. All the Old Testament people who are in the tombs are going to hear the voice of Christ. When? When he dies. He's going to Hades. They're going to hear his voice. Right? That's what you need to pick up on. So, and it's, it's the resurrection of the righteous. So, in Matthew chapter 22, 29 to 32. Why am I going there? Because it's the one with the Sadducees. He kind of mentions this. 22 chapter, or in Matthew 22, verse 29 to 32. This is the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. And so what does Jesus say? You are mistaken. Verse 29. Not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, not those guys that are lost in torment. He's the God of the living. And that's the guys in Abraham's bosom. And so we know that when Jesus dies, he goes to, uh, and I'll jump over to Luke chapter 23, verse 43. We know he, well, he said it in Matthew, I am going to go to the center of the earth for three days and three nights, the heart of the earth. That's where Hades is at. Jesus died and went there. Luke chapter 23, verse 43, to the thief on the cross, today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. 
Paradise is down in Hades. So that's important to note. And why does he go there? Because he has to teach them who he is. Kind of like Luke chapter 24. After he resurrected, he came to the apostles, verse 45. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. They didn't understand the scriptures. You have to understand that this, the Old Testament is talking about the Messiah coming into this world and he's going to die and he's going to be resurrected. If you cannot accept that, then it just, you you, you, you know, if, if that's totally against, and that's what Peter was saying, you know, Jesus said, I'm going to die and then and be rejected. I'm going to be rejected, then die, and then I'll rise. And Peter's going, no, that's not going to happen. Because Peter was taught the way the Jews thought that Jesus was going to come rule the world. So if you believe in something so hard, you can't accept the truth. Jesus comes back from the dead. And now he's able to what? Open their minds to understand the truth. And that's what he does for them here. And to become a Christian, to get into the kingdom, well, I shouldn't say get into the kingdom, to become a Christian, well, yeah, to get into the kingdom, to become a part of the assembly, you have to make the good confession. Matthew chapter 16 Peter says, who, who, you know, who, what do people say who, who I am? But who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. I also say to you, you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Peter's not the rock. James made that very clear last Sunday because that's what the Catholics believe. It's the confession. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Based upon that, we can baptize a person into Christ because they believe who Jesus is, right? And that's important to understand. But he had to go to Hades because they needed to make the good confession because everybody in Hades didn't understand the Old Testament. You think, oh, well, once you die, you're going to just, no, they're down there in Hades and they do not understand what they were writing because none of the mystery can be, re can be revealed until Christ dies, sheds his blood, and now sins can be forgiven. And now the mystery of God can be revealed. So the minute Jesus dies on the cross, the minute he dies on the cross, he goes down to Hades to teach these guys the good confession. They have to know who Jesus is. And the gates of Hades won't overpower my church. We always think that's the um, Christians. But it's not. It's the Old Testament people. And the word church, throw it out and just say assembly. Like Jesus is going to take us into heaven, but he's going to take them first. Because that's where he wants to have his assembly. They couldn't go into heaven because they didn't have their sins forgiven. And this is kind of interesting. Turn to John 13, because we were doing this on Tuesday. I didn't think I had it down, but I think I've got it down now. And it's interesting. If you can believe this, then you can believe this, and then you'll believe that. But if you can't believe this, You'll never believe these two. So you've got to open your mind to say, well, I'm wrong over here. So maybe I should look at this and believe this. And then doors have a tendency to open in God's word. So in, in chapter 13, Jesus, that's the night he's betrayed. This is when he just finished washing feet. Now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. Meaning I am now going to the cross. There's the glory of Christ. And God is glorified when Jesus goes to the cross because of his obedience. If you want to glorify God, obey Christ. Do things, be obedient. That's what glorifies Christ. That's what we need to do. So now is the son of man glorified because I'm going to the cross. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him 
immediately. So Christ on the cross is glorified. But then what's he say? God will also glorify him immediately. So it's pretty tough being on the cross and, and all of that. But he gets glorified immediately. And I'm not saying it's there at the cross. But the moment Jesus dies, where does he go? He goes right into Hades. And when he goes right into Hades, what's he do? He starts teaching the guys about who he is, Messiah. And just, this is what you got to get into your heart. Like, Jesus enters into Hades. And Moses and Abraham are going, that's the guy. And John the Baptist is going, he's the one. Right? Everybody is just thrilled. They don't understand, but they're going to now be taught that Jesus is the Christ. And so they can make the good confession. That's why he goes down there and there's his glory, right? But then look at 33. And this was kind of tripping me up. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And then verse 36, you know, Simon says, Lord, where are you going? Where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. So where am I going? I'm going to Hades, but you can't come there. That's not for you. I was for the Old Testament. And then I'm only going to be there like three days. He doesn't say this, obviously. But when he rises... And then when he ascends on high, that's where you're going to follow me. You're not following me down there. You can't come there. But you will follow me later. And where's that later going to take you? Right into the throne room. Okay? But that's not for you right now. So I, I just want to jump where uh, John chapter 11. And I know I'm kind of bopping all over the place right here. And, and John chapter 11 is very important because here we have Martha. And Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, verse 21, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he gives to you. And he says, your brother will rise again. Well, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, that's an important because when you look at the resurrection, it's not taught in the Old Testament. So where is Martha getting the resurrection of the last day? The only place that you, you can really, that I've been able to find, and I can be corrected, is Daniel chapter 12. And this is really cool in Daniel chapter 12. Verse 13. Because this is the end of the book. Daniel has prophesied about you know, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the destruction of Jerusalem, or not, well, destruction of Jerusalem. He's, you know, and he's also this, the destruction of the Roman Empire. He's talked about the Battle of Armageddon. Daniel sees that far. He's, he's got such a scope of vision. And then he's told, seal up the book for now, because all this stuff's going to be fulfilled later. But here's the neat part in verse 13. As for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. What's the end? Well, obviously it's death, right? Go your way to the end. You will enter into rest. When a, when a faithful Jew dies, where does he go? Abraham's bosom. You will enter into rest. And that's what happened to Daniel, okay? And... Rise for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Well, okay, so that's the resurrection day, judgment day. No, it's not. Because the end of the age and everything in the Old Testament was pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. All, Jesus said, I come to fulfill all scriptures. The end of the age is the end of the Mosaic system for the Jews. And it's at the end of the age, you will rise. And that word rise can be translated resurrection, but they don't, they say rise. But it's used as the resurrection in the New Testament. 
you will rise for your allotted portion at the end of the age. So there's a resurrection in Jesus' day of what? Of all the Old Testament people. Daniel rose at the end of the, uh, with, with all the rest of the guys. Jesus went down to Hades. They now understand who the Messiah is. They understand he shed his blood. Jesus can fully forgive all of these guys because he doesn't, they don't need to be baptized because when you're in the presence of God, he can forgive you. And if you're already dead, guess what? Jesus forgives all of these guys right? And then he takes them with them to heaven in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8. And I know a lot of this is going to be kind of hard for some people, but in Ephesians 4 8 he says when he ascended on when he ascended on high the ascension, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. When Jesus left Jerusalem and went up high, he took a host of captives. Satan's already up in heaven because when Jesus goes into heaven, Satan gets thrown out of heaven and so does his angels. So there's the only thing can be would be the Old Testament people. And then when we look into heaven, we see them there. Hebrews chapter 12. This is the one I just, I'm always harping on and, and you guys should have it memorized by now because I use it so often. You've come to Mount Zion. They are leaving Christianity to go to, back to Judaism. So he writes Hebrews to get them to get focused once again on the spiritual because they're not being spiritual. He says, you know, you're not coming to a mountain that's on fire and all this. You have come to, if you're a Christian, you have come to Mount Zion city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, to the festal assembly, because in heaven, it's a very happy place, because that's where people die and go to, a very happy place, because they're victorious. Church of the firstborn, there's the Christians, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. If you just drop back to chapter 11, verse 39, which is the, the wrap up of all the Old Testament heroes, Abraham and all of those guys, he says, all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. The Old Testament people had to stay in Hades waiting for the blood of Christ. Apart from us, they would not be made perfect, perfect being complete. So they're not perfect in, in verse 40, but now what do we see in, in verse 23? The spirits of the righteous made perfect. Why? Because Christ went down into Hades, taught them who he was, the Messiah, forgave them of their sins after they made the good confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he's not going to let Hades keep him from building his assembly. So he goes back on the surface. And then when he ascends into heaven, that's when he takes the Old Testament guys. That's what we see in Hebrews chapter 12. Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 4, 4. What we see in, in the throne room of God, as John is witnessing it right there. Around the throne were 24, uh, were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and, and golden crowns on their head. And then down in chapter 5, uh, verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp of gold, and, and they all sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the book. Who are the 24 elders? Well, it's the 12 apostles and it's the 12 tribes. It's representative of God's people. And they're in where? Heaven. Now, this is something you got to grasp because a lot of people will say, you don't go to heaven until the judgment day. Well, then why are all these people in heaven? 
That's the question I ask. Why does God teach us that in Hebrews and teach us that in Revelation? And he teaches it to what? To comfort one another. Understand this is God's plan. Not to drop you into a place called Hades for the next 2,000 years, but to take you into this glorious, wonderful home where all the dead in Christ are already there. Everybody that you've ever known is already there to greet you. That's the resurrection of life. Okay? Hang on to that one. And that's what Jesus said. All that are in the tombs are going to hear my voice, and they are going to come forth to a resurrection of life. Those who are in the tombs that did the evil deeds are going to a resurrection of judgment, but that doesn't happen until judgment day. So those guys are going to stand before God. These guys I'm going to take right into the throne room. Hang on to that. Now let's go back to John chapter 5, the third resurrection. The third resurrection is the resurrection from the dead. Verse 24, truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The dead are the walking dead. The dead are your neighbors, people at work. They're not spiritually alive. They're dead. The dead will hear my voice. And the dead who believes will have eternal life, not coming into judgment and has passed out of death into life. That's the third. Okay? <clears throat> And that's what the church teaches, though we don't teach it too well. Acts chapter 2, was it Acts chapter 2, 42? Ah, I don't think it is. I think I put it. No, it's not 242, 342. Well, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up on that verse. But he's saying that the, the, they were talking about the resurrection from the dead. Resurrection from the dead is the, this world of death. We're being resurrected from the dead. And, and that's the thing that we need to get a, get a handle on. The resurrection happens right now. It's an ongoing resurrection. You've been resurrected is the point. John chapter 14, back to John chapter 13, well, John chapter 14, it's interesting do not let your hearts be troubled, okay? Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, many dwelling places. If it were not, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Not for 2,000 years, but I'm going to go prepare a place. If I go to prepare a place, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know the way where I'm going. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know. Where are you going? How do we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. What is the way? You know? You know the way. I've been telling you this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Luke chapter 18, verse 33. And I'm going to Matthew chapter 16. 21 because all the way to jerusalem all this way he's been telling them what's going to happen to him matthew 16 21 from that from that time on jesus began to show his disciples he must go to jerusalem suffer many things from the elders chief priests scribes be killed and be raised on the third day he keeps telling them we're going to jerusalem we're going to be rejected i'm going to be uh, crucified and I'm going to be buried and then I'm going to rise on the third day. I am the way. Lord, we don't know where you're going. I, I'm going to prepare a place. What's the way? The way is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You have to believe in the way. The only way for Jesus to make it back up into heaven is to die for our sins, to be buried, to go down into Hades, and then the resurrection, and then the ascension, 
that he goes. Hang on to that. Because then you look at Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to verse 7. And what's he talking about? We have to be baptized. Catch this. Do you not know that all of us, Romans 6, 3, have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, right? So we've all died in the waters of baptism. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. If we've been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. You've gone down into your death and you've been resurrected. Now it's really cool and sometimes we, we miss this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, think about the resurrection here. That after you came out of the waters of baptism, what does he say? Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, raised us up. And that word raised can be translated resurrected. Raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As we are today, we are not the physical, we are the spiritual. And, and when we die to ourselves, God raised us, resurrected us from the waters of baptism. Symbolic, of course, but we're in, into the, th the throne room of God. Raised us up, seated us in the heavenlies. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. And he keeps pushing the point. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. He also raises us, chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Stay in that spiritual. You've been raised. This is the first resurrection. Uh, Colossians 1, 13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. You've got eternal life right now. You need to understand that. And you're in the presence of God because he's in the presence of you because he lives within you. And I, if I've got eternal life, then I can have that confidence. That's the resurrection that we preach about. We get into Christ's resurrection when we come, when we present ourselves to Christ. And that is the third resurrection that's the one that's ongoing in in this day and age hebrews chapter four ah and when you understand that hebrews let us let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest any of you may seem to have come short of it we can enter into the rest of god because it's through the waters of baptism we're into his presence for we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said. There's that spiritual level that we've entered into. Look at look at Hebrews chapter 10. And, and you can play with Hebrews chapter 4. But that's what he's talking about. But Hebrews chapter 10. Something for us to think about. Where am I? 19 to 25. Brethren, since we have confidence... To enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. You can enter the holy place right now. We have that confidence. We don't deserve it. But it's the blood of Christ that has cleansed us. That has resurrected us. So that we have that confidence. How? By a new and living way. What's the new living way? Death, burial, resurrection. Which he inaugurated for us through the veil. That's his flesh. Because we join him in death. We join him in the resurrection. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, bodies washed with pure water. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful. Let us consider one another how to stimulate to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. We have... We know the way. And then I'll just take us back to Revelation chapter 20. Verse 6. Actually, I got to 
kind of read verse. Yeah, verse six would be fine. Well, four. I saw the thrones, them who sat on in, in heaven. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast and not received the mark on their forehead or their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Now, you need to understand those guys were came in the first resurrection was their baptism. And then they lived their life, died, and then God took them right into heaven. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. They will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, this is interesting. Once saved, always saved? Well, no, we, we understand that. Because what does Paul say in Philippians? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And in Hebrews chapter 6, 4 to 6, it says, you know, if a person falls away, well, there's no longer uh, sacrifice for sins. But this is the interesting one coming out of Philippians chapter 3, 10 and 11. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's interesting that Paul's saying, you know, I'm a Christian now, and I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Because if you go down in the in the waters, you know you've got the Holy Spirit. You know you've got eternal life. You know you've got full confidence in your walk with God. But you still have to walk with God. And I'm going to keep walking with God, says Paul. But I'm, I'm doing this so I understand or I know the power of his resurrection. But he says in, in the end, in verse 11, that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You have to stay faithful to the end of your life. And the moment you die, the Holy Spirit who lives within you passes you over to Christ. Who now comes and greets you and takes you into heaven and confesses your name. Where you get to meet all the loved ones that have gone on before. Are there Christians in heaven? Well, Revelation 6, 9 to 11, they're under the altar. In chapter 7, verse 13 to 15, there's a number in heaven in John's time that are all wearing white robes washed in the blood of Christ. In John's time. And the reason that John writes the Revelation is because all these Christians are going to suffer at the hands of the Romans. And they needed to have confidence that if I die, I'm going someplace. And if they died, they were going into heaven. That's the promise. That's the encouragement. That's what Philippians says. Encourage one another with these words. So what am I trying to say here? Because I'm crazy. There's three resurrections. Past, present, and future. That's what you need to understand. The past resurrection is all all the guys that were in Abraham's bosom have gone to be with Christ in heaven, waiting for his blood. We see them in heaven through the revelation and through Hebrews. That is the resurrection that Jesus promised, what he was saying right there. Future resurrection is only for the wicked. And they are going to get judged on judgment day. Like, if you're not washing the blood of Christ, if you haven't been resurrected, if you're not washing the blood of Christ in judgment, then you're going to the resurrection of the judgment. So all those guys that have died and they have not been washing the blood of Christ, they're going to stand before God. They are going to bow their knee, right? And that's the future resurrection that he talks about. But the one you have to pick up on, and that's the one that I couldn't see before, is the present the present resurrection is I've gone down into the waters of baptism and I've joined Christ in death. And now through this, I come up and now he translates me into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the resurrection. Blessed and holy is part in the first resurrection. Now I can fall from this or I can keep on struggling and doing my best knowing that the moment I die, I'm not going down to Hades. The moment I die, I'm going into the throne of God. 
because of the blood of Christ. And so what we teach other people, when we reach out into the world, this is the thing. They, you can get all your sins forgiven. You can have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And this is what we call the first resurrection. Can you lose it? Yes. That's the important. But can you hang on to it? Well, Paul says, I'm, I do everything in my power that I, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I've got it, but I can lose it. So that's why you got to keep the struggle. Because when you think about it, so many people say, no, there's only one resurrection day and everybody's going to stand there and everybody. Well, no, you can't have confidence. I'm going to die and go to Hades and then on the judgment day, I'm going to get judged. The minute you die, you're judged. We know that. You're either in, well, as far as Jesus was teaching his time, you're either in Hades or you're in torment. You're judged. Why does it sound weird that the minute I die, I can enter into the throne room of God? Especially since all through this life of mine, I can enter into the throne room of God, God, approach the throne of grace to receive mercy. And I'm in the presence of God. And Paul says, I, you know, I'd rather die and be with Christ. So you can have that kind of confidence that that's truly where we're headed to, not the heart of the earth. We're headed to the throne room of God. And it's pretty sad that I'm, I'm for myself starting to figure this out. Now, maybe I've got it all wrong, but I'll give you the verses and you prove me wrong. But right now, I believe we got it all right. But I'll bet you most of us in here haven't thought about it haven't thought that there's actually three and haven't thought that there's one ongoing right now because if you baptize somebody you're pulling them up out of that water and they're in the resurrection right it's very much alive and christ has died to give us this opportunity and that's what i'll leave with you this morning a little bit of confusion but if there is let's talk I mean, isn't that what it's about? The scriptures are for us to dive deep and let's talk about the things we don't fully understand. Thank you.